And let's quantify this in terms of how much this contributes to the economy. How much money do they make? Is it, um, can it be quantified to what a traditional business, owners, or business owner would make, for instance? Well, not all at the moment. Um, I, I know that uh, the e-commerce shops combined, um, they've attracted a, a, an investment of close to $200 million, the wow. e-commerce shop combined, um, uh, the, the, the major ones. They've done that. Uh, and I know that uh, the guys um, called um, uh, Iroko, uh, Iroko um, total, I uh, think about, I think the last one they raised about $8 million. Um, it's growing. Uh, a lot of seed capital is growing. Um, a South African company, uh, 88 MP, just launched recently, and um, they are giving seed capital of between $10,000 to $100,000. Um, we must understand that it has to happen in phases. The phase where we are now are the phase where the ideas have to be incubated. incubated. The, uh, some of the ideas have to be accelerated mm. and, and made commercial. So we, we may not begin to see the, we should not expect to begin to see the commercial gains immediately as a nation. That is the truth. Uh, if you look at the history of the way Silicon Valley, that's the same way it started. It started with a lot of group of people fiddling with ideas, fiddling with ideas. I mean, I mean, I heard live from the man, Steve Wozniak, how for 10 years they were struggling. I mean, they were struggling, they were struggling until the Apple II break came, you know. But he talked about the struggling period. So when, when you, when the traditional businesses, yes, now are still ahead. But uh, I, I can tell you the e-commerce shops are doing some wonders. I mean, they're doing some... Crazy figures, <laughs> crazy figures that you would not even imagine. Uh, my friend who launched a, a, a small, a, a very young e-commerce shop, not like the big guys, what we live in, he's raking about a, a, a million monthly. Dollars or Naira? Naira. But uh, when I say it's small, I mean small. I mean, he just started it small, no big names. You know, the other guys have foreign um, um, backers, and, pa backers and, and, and partners, but he, I mean, strictly local, 100% local. And he's raking about a million, you know. So, um, you know, he's not doing badly. Mm -hmm. um, but, but again, if he tells you what, he, what, what has gone into it, it's quite huge, you know. Because the way, I mean, take for example, um, a South African company invests, say, $10 million in a startup firm. The first thing he wants to do is to get the right programmers. So what does he do? He's willing to pay what the average guys here cannot pay, okay? So he goes there, he purchases the, the good programmers. And then uh, what, he's left with, what you are left with is the guys who are growing. What do you do? That you need, as a, as a younger player, you need to start training your, your own programmer. It's going to cost money. So everything's going to take a process. We need the right skill. We need to grow the skill. And again, that's why government is key. Uh, because curriculum, that's to start from the schools. You know, we, we need to begin to train. I mean, I went to, to the university in Nigeria. Unfortunately, I was trying to get a job. But that's what, that was the, the outlook. That was not like training me to become an entrepreneur. So we need to begin to change people's mindset, job creation. Now, the, the thing about ICT is that ICT would, in as much as it will create jobs, it will cause some certain jobs to be redundant and become useless, more or less. So that's, that's the mindset. So if somebody is going for, uh, to be, wants to be this uh, uh, kind of professional, uh, you, you must look at five, ten years now, would this profession be relevant? Would it be something hmm. that uh, ICT will not make redundant? I mean, many years ago, there used to be people they used to call people who write shorthand. I remember those people, you know, those days, shorthand, they were very good people. They were very proud of their profession back in the days. But today, I mean, who, who I mean, so that's, that's one of the things about technology. And many more would happen. Okay. Many more. So let me just ask Fred. Most of these um, businesses who are online, they need funds. Yeah. You've mentioned that a couple of partners, either foreign or domestic, actually part give you know funds for such companies to start. But then the traditional business owner seems to always get uh, more funds than companies who actually go online. Yes. Uh, well, again, again, it, it's a structure. Now, let me say this. Actually, at the moment now, you have more foreign venture capitalists than local. Mm -hmm. So actually, the people controlling and investing in this, in this space is more foreign. So we might be, we should be ready, or there's a possibility of another round of colonialism online. Yes, because I mean, if the big players are all foreign, it's good for the better. Again, it means that the money, when they make the profit, is repatriated. Exactly. That's, that's a fact. You know, so we must, our business gurus and our business owners, or the people who have capital, should begin to think about how to invest in the tech space. Because the tech space they don't believe in, the foreigners believe in it, and they are 
pouring it money by the seconds. But that's where people like you come in. People like you should begin to champion this course, begin to make people understand that, look, your money is safe. Oh, this is a very good venture to come into. This, this is a profit at the end of the day. This is what you stand to gain. This is what you stand to lose. You're very correct. I, 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 and it's part of, uh, part of the, the things that we're doing. I, I for, for, for example, I, I'll be starting a hub very soon, just like what the CC Hub guys are doing, somewhere where young people can come also sit down, train, and then we'll find a way to get funding for them. Because you see, again, it has to do with the trust thing. Mm. How can these people trust that their money is safe with these young kids? So there has to be a structure. And it's just the way Silicon Valley is not, it did, I mean, it wasn't wishful thinking. It was a carefully planned, thought out, and implemented process that took place over the years. So that's the same way it has to happen here. We must also give people, the outsiders who are not techies or who are not in the technology space, the confidence that when you invest here, it is safe. But then, like venture capital, the way it is, it's a game of chance. Yeah. Actually, there are more businesses that die around the Silicon Valley area than the ones that succeed. Much more, about 90% die. So they are great ideas, but you know why they don't fill it? Because at every point in time, they have about 5,000, 10,000 ideas in the incubation. So also, all sorts beyond what you can... I said, if, Mark, if um, Steve Wozniak can be telling us that he is even marveled. I mean, this guy was the brain behind everything engineering in Apple. And he was saying that he was, he was a marvel at the level and what is happening in the technology space. So it simply tells you that we are at an amazing speed. And, and I mean, there's a new concept called the Internet of Things, where everything is said to be connected to everything from your, I mean, they're, they're, I mean there's, a, there's a researcher in Hong Kong that's trying to work on ladies' high eyelashes that'll be electronic, <laughs> um, fingernails that'll be electronic, um, all sorts. And everything will be connected to the internet. So, no, Fred, I don't think a lot of people, well, maybe a lot of people will, you know, buy into that idea. Yeah. But let's, would you, <laughs> let's, let's leave that one for a minute. Let's talk about, um, um, you know, a lot of banks these days mm. in the financial circles, you see a lot of them coming on the internet to try to promote their business, mm. to sell products and the rest of it. Mm. And a lot of people are keen into it, mm. or, or a lot of people keen into it. Yes. That's another thing. So in terms of... Um, Financial transactions, online banking, and other forms of financial transactions. How how much of that has you know been successful in the last couple of years? I mean, it's been huge. The, the, the number of transactions that go on online these days is is it's huge. Um, I think um, I, I I read over the uh, over last week where NIDSS released the report. I think almost two hundred billion for just January and February thereabouts. Um, worth of transaction. So it just tells you that it's increasing, it keeps growing, uh, more people have access to ATM. Um, banks are beginning to adapt what is called social banking where with your um, Facebook account only you can start up a, a regular account. Uh, so it, it's increasing. The number of ATMs have grown. Um, banks now have what you call the e-channels, the e-banks, e e e-channel banks where you just strictly ATMs. Uh, so it, it's growing by the day and by the second. Uh, but, but again, it brings up an issue, and that's the issue of security. Um, a friend of mine who is a very good, uh, who is a very skilled, you know, one of the things that I think I'll just mention that one of the things that I always say and I keep reiterating that Nigeria needs to begin to raise cyber warriors that will defend us in the, in the, in the threats of well, cyber, because the wars of the future will be fought through the cyber war. But let us leave that aside. What I'm trying to say is that a friend of mine actually used the bank as a case study. The guy hacked into the banking system and added about three, four, five, six figures. And about two billion showed up in his account. And nobody was able to detect that? Nobody until he, I mean, until he now told them that this is what he did. So, so that means we even have issues of um, um, cyberspace security. <laughs> Nigeria, I mean, we don't, even have, we don't even have a strategy for that. I mean, we don't have a strategy for that. I mean, um, there's no strategy to defend anything cyber. Yes, so uh, cyberspace is very, very porous. Most of the data, um, just set for, so for a few companies that just recently, like Computer Warehouse that's recently launched a uh, local data center, most of our data are stored abroad. And if you're hearing about what's happening with Swift, so it means that um, the guy in the NSA can sit back in the US and he knows what um, is going on here. There's nothing, no, 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 no national secret. It's not there. So cyber threat is a big issue. A lot of banks are, are have very porous websites, very porous infrastructure that people can actually hack into. But again, that, that again is part of the process. Um, the way technology works is that when you come up with, with something, with, with an invention, with a software, over time there will be Patch, there, will be, there will be need for patches, and that's why you see Microsoft and the code, they release patches every now and then, because there are a group of people who, you know, there's something called ethical hacking. 
Ethical hacking means that you are licensed to hack, but it's ethical. So it means that you can hack and then report that you have hacked this, and this is the process that you use to hack it. Hacking so in, any w in any manner, in any form, any language you want to call it is still a criminal offense. No, it's not. There's ethical hacking. Hmm. It's, it's, it's like a word, but it's ethical hacking. Well, Fred, we'll